Thank you all for joining us. My name is Sam Fletcher and I'm the Executive Director of NASW New York State. Um, I have my co-facilitator here with me, Erica Day, and we are thrilled that you're joining us for, we believe, this very important topic of how do we take care of ourselves, especially in the midst of a global pandemic. We have an election coming up in three weeks. We have a Supreme Court seat that's open. We're in the middle of Black Lives uh, Matter moment in the movement. So we have all of these things happening and we're social workers. So how do we take care of ourselves during this? So hopefully you will learn from us and we'll learn from you. We want this to be interactive. So we're gonna actually start with Erica and she's gonna talk a little bit about what she does and how she organizes herself. Then I'll talk a little bit about my self care practice and then we'll open it up to you and then as a treat we'll actually end with Erica leading us through some different techniques that she uses. So Erica I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks Sam. Hi guys um, so my name is Erica. I'm a social worker um, on Long Island so I work as a psychotherapist right now. Um, I'm also a yoga and meditation teacher. I've been doing that um, for most of this year. Um, so my biggest thing in terms of self-care that I've learned for myself has been coming to a place of mindfulness. And it's like one of those terms that you're probably hearing a lot now, especially in the social work space, because it's becoming something that we want to use in practice. But mindfulness for yourself and talking about becoming more aware of who you are and where you are and how your body feels and how you move through each day is something that I found essential. And hopefully if you don't use it already, it's something that you can learn to incorporate. Um, like Sam said, there's so much going on. And as social workers, it's really easy to get lost in that mix because we're expected to be at the forefront of each thing. And when you're at the forefront of each thing, like you're, you're taking a lot of the hits, you're taking a lot of the a lot of the brunt of like the trauma for your patients, for yourself, for your family members, for everything that's going on. And, you know, we, as social workers, we love being on the front lines. We love stepping up. We love advocating. But are you getting lost in the shuffle? Are you getting overwhelmed? Are you forgetting to check in with yourself? You know, sometimes it just feels like you're just floating through space. Like every day you just wake up, you show up, and you hope you make it to the end of the day. And that's not how you want to operate. You want to be able to operate in a way that you are aware of maybe not every single moment, but the moments as they come, as they're going, as you're navigating through the day, because you don't want to get lost in that shuffle. You know, there's a lot of times, um, one, of the, one of the funniest things that I've learned that I never thought about until someone taught me it was, are you clenching your jaw right now? And a lot of times I was like, oh my gosh, I am. And I never thought about it. I never noticed it. I never thought to think, let me unclench my jaw. Let me relax my tongue through the roof of my mouth. Are my shoulders hunched over? Is my back tight? Because I was just so busy going and going and going and going. And we're in a society that tells you going and going and going is what you should be doing. If you're not burnt out, then you're not working hard enough. If you're not killing yourself, if you're not hustling, as we like to say now, then you're not really trying hard. And I think that we have to remove that narrative. And, you know, it's important to work hard. It's important to get things done. It's important to be the best we can be. But when you're constantly outpouring and you're not giving back to yourself, you'll burn yourself out. You'll have nothing to give you will get to a point where you struggle to do your job the way that you know you can do it. You struggle to be a parent the way you know you can, a friend, a partner, whatever it is, because you have nothing within yourself to give to other people. And I think another thing that's really important is to remember it's not just about giving to yourself so that we can give to other people. You know, sometimes self-care gets 
taught as like, oh, if you don't have enough in you, you can't give to anybody else, but also just making sure you have enough for you just for you. It's, it's hard to remember sometimes that like, as the world is going on around us and, and we have to play all these roles and wear all these hats, it's important to also just be you for you and be present for you. Even if you didn't have a single thing to do for the, the rest of the week, the rest of the month, the rest of the year, it's still important to continue to check in with yourself, find these tips and tools so that you can continue to function in a way that's best for you. And then the next step is now that I'm in a place that's good for me, I can now give to others. There's this um, story um, about a man who drives a taxi and he's like the happiest taxi driver. He loves driving his taxi. He loves serving his community. And the most important thing in his day is making sure his car is tuned, making sure his car is functioning, making sure he always has enough gas, making sure his tires are filled. He's making sure that his system is good so that he has enough to give to everyone else. If his car was constantly breaking down, if he was constantly running out of gas, if he was constantly, you know, if he was just patching up his tire instead of properly fixing a tire, you know, a lot of things that we do are just like quick bandages on things. They're not really changing or really like actually self-care. A lot of things are just like easy fixes, it feels like. But because he's constantly taking care of his car, he's constantly in a position to help and serve others. So I know for me, naturally there's things like yoga. I like moving my body. I like fitness. Fitness isn't for everybody, but there are ways you can move mindfully that I find really enjoyable, even if it's just 10 minutes. Find a way to just Feel the release in your body because we carry so much of our stress physically. A lot of our stress and anxiety, depression manifests itself physically. So, you know, you don't have to be a marathon runner, but can you take 10 minutes in the morning to do a stretch? Can you stretch during the day on your 15 minute break? Can you? take a walk during your break? Can you find a way to physically feel the release, notice where the tension is, and let it pass? Um, another thing I have found incredibly valuable, which is my number one, is meditation. Um, I know that meditation has, has these like preconceptions, and some people think it's a religious thing. Some people think that you have to like basically be a monk to accomplish it. Um, but meditation is just the simple art of coming back to yourself. It's the art of coming back to your breath, checking in and noting thoughts and also letting them go. And the thing that's helped me the most with meditation is finding a place where I can be kind to myself. And I think a lot of people who get stressed and get anxious, a lot of times we start to like get mad at ourselves for it. We start to beat ourselves up for it. We start to say, oh, you're so unorganized, get it together. Oh my goodness, like you're a mess. Or, oh, I can't believe you didn't do this. Can't believe you didn't get this done. Even with self-care, sometimes we get mad at ourselves because we didn't get to do the one thing that we thought we would do. And I find in meditation, when the thoughts arise, you can note it and then let it pass. And a lot of times too, that's kind of how you learn to check in with yourself every day. Something will come up, a negative thought, a stressful thought, a sad thought. And it's not that the thought is wrong. And that's the great thing about meditation. Your thoughts are gonna come. Even if you see a picture of like someone who looks like they're sitting peacefully at like a river or like all these like fancy images of meditation, that person's brain is still running. But they have found a way to constantly note the thought and then let the thought go. Note the feeling in the body, 
breathing into that space, letting it go, being kind to yourself when you're breathing and then something comes up and you get frustrated that you've lost your train of focus, but then you just let it go. And there are certain things that we have that we have the power to let it come to us and let it go. So like for me, it's a lot of the things that I'm consuming, I've learned I don't need to. Um, I read recently the importance of staying informed without being overwhelmed. And I think that that's something that we as social workers really struggle with because we wanna be informed, we wanna know what's going on because it affects us, it affects our clients, it affects our practice. But there are certain steps that I've found where I can be informed and then be able to put my phone down and breathe. You know, if, some, if watching something makes you very anxious, it gets you worked up, it gets you done, maybe not watching it, maybe finding a summary of it somewhere from a source that you trust. Um, you know, I try not to read the news past like 9 p.m. because I, we call it doom scrolling. <laughs> you're just scrolling and you're just like, oh my gosh, the world is falling apart. And then I put my phone down and then I'm just in bed like, oh my gosh, the world is falling apart. And then I can't sleep. So, you know, setting time limits for yourself. My phone has become what I like to call a blank space. I try my best not to have too much on my phone now. I used to have every email account, every notification in the world, every app that I could think of that I thought would keep me organized was actually just causing me more stress. So I have a rule. I don't check an email before 9 a.m. I stop checking my emails by 6 p.m. I set a timer on my phone for do not disturb mode. So now when I, when I think it's 8 p.m. hits, unless I make the effort to go into my phone and see who's messaging me, I'll see it in the morning. And, and, th and that depends on you and your work and what you do, but you have to be able to stop and think, do I need to know what's happening at work past a certain point? Some, some jobs you do. Um, sometimes there's, you know, you're on call. I wouldn't put my phone on do not disturb if I was on call, but can you do that? Can you not have so many notifications on your phone? Because it ignites something inside of us, that constant trigger of something's happening and I don't know and I have to be aware and I have to check my phone now and it takes you out of a moment. You know, you could be enjoying uh, a TV show that you like to do, that you like to watch. And then suddenly your phone's ding, 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 ding. And now you're out of that moment. You're out of enjoying what you were just doing because now you feel like, oh, I have to get to this. I have to be aware. And not to say that you don't have to be aware, but do you need to know exactly what's happening in that moment or can you just enjoy what you're doing and come back to that thing later. Um, another thing that really helps me is walking. And it's, it's, it's getting cold out, so it's getting a little harder. <laughs> but um, even just finding a space in your home, maybe in your office, wherever you are, and just walking around slowly, following my breath, feeling the ground underneath me. I think that's a big thing too, that a lot of people, you're just like poof, 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 constantly going, constantly going. You don't even take a second to realize that like, you have two feet that are planting on the ground and you can feel from your ankles to your big toe, like the movement in your feet and just that body awareness, that awareness of the space that you're in, of your breath, those sort of things. Um, and then there's like, fun self-care things like um, in the past Thursday nights used to be my night to watch how to go with murder and like that's what I did didn't like that was it or um, I really like 
painting. Bought some paint from Marshalls during the quarantine and just turned my phone off. Found a nice YouTube tutorial on how to paint a sunflower <laughs> and just, and that's what I did. And, and I wanna hear from you guys too, like what are some of the things that you do? But the most important thing I think about self-care is coming to an understanding that it's something meant to bring you a sense of peace, a sense of joy, and a way that allows you to find more ease throughout your life. You know, stress, self-care shouldn't become a stressful thing. It shouldn't become the, a chore. You shouldn't start to feel stressed that you didn't get to do the self-care. You know, honoring yourself is also honoring when you can't do the things that you want to do, but knowing you can come back to it, knowing that there's no judgment for it, knowing that not every day is going to be a great evening to sit back and turn your phone off and watch TV and wake up in the morning and, and no problem. There's going to be days where it's not going to be that easy. Meditation might not be that easy if that's something you practice. You might go to the gym and, and hate the whole hour that you're there. But you're honoring yourself by showing up. You're honoring yourself by showing up for yourself. Even if that day it's not perfect, you can't get to it. Knowing that you, you came, you tried, you acknowledged that maybe you weren't able to do that. And then the next day is a completely different day to try again. And that's, and that's why you wanna be mindful because every day is a new day to find awareness, to find ways to honor yourself and to, and to care for yourself. Erica. Okay. I wanted to do this with Erica because when we were talking, I told her I am really bad at self-care. And I think it's really important that people hear that, that, you know, as social workers, we talk about self-care to the point that I know NASW is even looking at putting that into the code of, F, uh, code of ethics so that social workers spend more time on self-care because I think a lot of us are notoriously bad at self-care. And um, I have been extremely bad at it in the past to where I've had like physical problems and you know, I've, I've gotten to places that are really bad for my physical health because I didn't even recognize I was that bad because I wasn't taking care of myself at all. And I have, started to work on this in the last like six or seven years and I've made improvements. I still by no means would say I'm good at it, but I'm better at it. So I wanted to talk about some of the things, um, some of the steps I took to get better at it. Um, so I, there's a, a couple of things. Um, one is kind of knowing yourself and what what gives you your energy and what gives you like that time to refresh so i appear to be an extrovert but i'm actually not so i always say i'm a closeted introvert um because i i do great around people and i like being around people but i get my energy from being alone or with i'm native so or with my tribe which is my family so that's where i really refresh is is in that time. So one of the things that I've done, um, I came to NASW uh, on September 3rd last year, 2019. So I've been here a little over a year. When I came, I knew that I wouldn't be able to implement some of the new practices that I had adopted like in the last couple of years. So I told my family, I said, give me a year. Like, give me a year, and during the first year, I can't promise that I'm not gonna work on the weekend. I can't promise that the hours are gonna be bad, but if you give me a year to get to a place where I wanna be at NASW, then I will work back to that. So we're there now. I've been here a little over a year now, and my family's done. They're like, you said one year, it's been a year. <laughs> so now I'm working to get back to that place. So one of the things I started doing in August and September is, I stopped working on the weekend. So like when COVID hit, I was working seven days a week because there was a lot of stuff going on. The chapter was very busy. 
So, you know, August, September, I stopped doing that. And I stopped checking email when I got off on Friday night. I tried to be off by five on Friday night and I didn't check it again until Monday morning. And like Erica was saying, like my phone, the little email icon, it used to count the emails and just that number would stress me out. Like, cause sometimes I'll come back on Monday morning and have 150 emails and that's really stressful to me and I can't relax if I know I have that many emails waiting for me. So like I figured out how to get rid of that number on my phone. So all I see is the mail icon and I have no idea how many like emails that I have. So I, that's been incredibly helpful. Just making that one change has been really good because like for my children, they're old, like they're adults, like I'm 17 year old and 19 year old and 20 year old, but they still want their time with me. Um, it's been very good for them to know the weekend is our time. And like, if they perceive I'm doing, if they even hear a word that sounds like work on the weekend, they freak out. <laughs> and they're like, no, the weekend's ours. You said the weekend was ours. So I do still work some late nights because we have a lot of volunteers and I can't say I'm not working weekends and I'm not working nights. So like with NASW, they know I have late nights. Um, and sometimes like next week, I actually have an event every single night. So next week will be late every night, but I'm trying to get that down to where it's maybe two or three times a week and I have earlier nights the other nights, but still that's a work in progress. So I'm working toward that. Um, oh, the other thing I'm doing, so I'm not the only one who's like unhealthy at the office with like not having self-care, not having boundaries, like the whole staff is like that. So the good news is they're great. Like they're fantastic workers. They've done so much to turn the chapter really around in the last year and they put in so much time. But now like that's the other thing we're doing is that I told them our goal, like starting in September, I said, our goal is to get healthy. So like, I don't want you working extra hours. I don't want you, if you're, if you're working a night, you need to take time during the day, the next day. So it's, it's helping them get to that point too. And I think also at NASW, we can't tell social workers to be healthy and to take care of themselves. If we're not doing that as a chapter, like we have to model that that can be done and that we'll do it. So we're working on it. We're not there. Like I just had my one year review and I was talking to the, the president of the board and he said, what's your, what's your goal for the next year? And I said, this is my goal. Literally my first goal is to get the chapter healthy and get us to a place where we have balance and where we have boundaries and where people have free time because we'll all be better workers if we do that. So that we're working on still a work in progress. Um, and then Oh, also the other thing is taking time off. So like how many social workers take time off or take a vacation, but you still have people contacting you? That's not good. Like when you're off, you need to be totally off because you're gonna be in a, such a better place when you come back. So it's really about setting those boundaries. And if you have a supervisor or someone who's not honoring that, like it, it may be time to try to have that discussion with them to say, like, I have to refresh. <laughs> like, I need to not think about work. I need to step away, not think about my clients, not think about anything and then come back because you'll be in such a better place if you do that. At least I know I am. Like, if I can take that time away, I, I feel so much better and it, it, I'm in a better place when I come back to the work. Um, one thing I was talking to Erica, Erica was really helping me like to prepare for this because she's, she's really good at self care. So as we were talking, I was like, I started writing things down like, oh, I do do this. And that is self care. You're right. So like, one of the things I do, I have this nice jacuzzi tub that I've, I've lived in this house 11 years. We never even used it till two years ago. So we've started like where we'll take baths at the j jacuzzi tub. Um, and that's a big deal. It's so relaxing. Like when we do that, we feel so much better. Like everyone, it, it does a lot better when we do that. So it's something that we've implemented, but uh, it's something I look forward to. And that's one of the things Eric and I were talking about is having that something that you're looking forward to. And I want you to talk about what we talked about if, if that doesn't happen. So like, those are the things that I try to do. And for me, 
like one of the big things is food. Like I love to eat <laughs> and I like eating very specific things. So like every weekend I get special food and it's something for me to look forward to. It sounds kind of silly, but I look forward to it. It's a break. Like, and then I really enjoy it. Like I really enjoy eating the food. Um, for me, the one, one self-care thing I've, I've done for the last 15 years that I still do is exercise. I do not do well if I don't exercise. So I, I have to exercise every morning. And um, I had a hard time whenever the pandemic, pandemic hit because all the gyms closed and I got out of my routine. Like I do better if it's in the morning. So it took me a couple months to like implement my exercise at home but as soon as I did, I immediately felt better. So like, that's another thing that I continue to do. It's like, it really is like the endorphins. The endorphins are, are so good for me. Um, and then nature with, with my culture, like I said, I'm native in our culture, nature is really important to us as a people and being out in nature. I have one son, my kids are adopted. One of my sons is Cheyenne Arapaho. We kayak. That's how we connect. It's how we connect with nature is through kayaking. So like finding time to do that or taking a walk outside. And I know it's gotten bad and I know my stress was, get, is, was getting bad because I was telling my husband who likes to walk outside with me that I didn't even want to walk outside because I would see people and I needed time where I didn't see any people because I was so getting so burned out. And I was like, that's a bad place to be to not want to walk outside because I don't want to pass people on the, on the sidewalk or in the park. So I was like, I really have to look at that as a symptom that I'm not doing well with my self care. And I have to get to a place because I, I should be okay to go for a walk. I'm not even talking to the people. It was just seeing the people. That I was like, it's causing me stress. I need to just be by myself, like in my room for a while. So those are the things I've done during the pandemic. And I did like what Erica said with what you consume, because there is something every single day right now. There's an emergency, there's, you know, things that are happening that impact people. And it is hard to step away from that. It's really hard for me with what do we respond to? What do we not respond to? How do we respond? And how, is this, how do we make it okay that we're not responding right now? but that will respond in a few days. And that's something that I've had to work on with that, like, how do I ever get that balance if we respond to everything in real time? Like, I don't think we would. So like, that's another thing that like we've been working on. But I would love to, one of the things Erica and I really wanted was to hear from you. Like, so what are some of the things you're doing for self-care? What are some of the things you think you know, you need to improve on. Um, what have you been doing, oh, like, since the pandemic, since everything that's going on right now? Bob, it looks like you're still muted. I grew up uh, with my family going to Castle Hill Pool in the Bronx every summer. And the um, essential uh, belief at Castle Hill Pool was that your worth as a human being was largely based on your ability to play handball. Um, that is sort of in my genes. Uh, there's a book uh, done by the people who did the Gallup poll uh, called Now Discover Your Strengths. And they've got 32 empirical things. And their thesis is sort of, you take two of the three the things that are meaningful to you and you make like a bouquet. And that's the way you live your life. The only thing that stuck with me was the theme of significance. You know, the Castle Hill pool, after a while, um, I wasn't a very good handball player and I got sick and tired of no respect. Uh, so in my counseling job at the YMCA in Yonkers, I practiced. Um, 
And the only time I saw my father look proud was when I played handball with him at the JCC and I was the best handball player on the court. Um, so these, these are things in my background and um, it may seem like um, out of space to some degree, but it's a little bit uh, like the research was done in the people in the Holocaust and um, what they found was the people who tended to survive. Hello, lost me. Hello. We got you. We can still hear you. Oh, now you muted though. That the people who survived had something significant in their life yet to be accomplished. And um, as much as I also would like to make a blog uh, or a website with my wisdom, um, uh, my primary goal is to uh, be able to play and improve my game. And um, Sudzi Munchek uh, was voted as having the best backhand in racquetball, but his swing was like Joe DiMaggio's home run swing. It involved the upper body rotation of almost 360 degrees. So I sprained my ankle doing that. So I'm in physical therapy now. <laughs> <laughs> work on it and, and looking forward to the day when I can get back on the court and and the people that I play with they admire uh, my superior skills so I like the fact that they want to touch me um, and I'm significant when I play ball so so that that's one of the things that I'm looking forward to Love that, Bob. And I should also tell people you actually add to my wellness plan because Bob emails me every day and he sends me funny joke emails and cute animal videos. And he makes sure that I take a break every day and watch these videos and read these jokes so that I get a little break. So I do want to thank you for being part of my wellness plan. <laughs> Likewise, I'm sure. I, I love a responsive audience. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I like that even as even as you're telling the story, Bob, you can tell that doing that brings you a lot of joy. And that's what we want to have in like our in like our practice. Like something that like brings you joy that sort of takes you out of the craziness and like you just go play handball. It, it could be something as simple as that, making sure that you play handball a couple of days a week. Um yeah, I love that. That was great. <laughs> I played with the A players and um, they were a little too good for me. I got too ambitious and started to injure myself. So I went to the B players and the morning that I played with them and it went well, in the afternoon, I found myself singing, I'm the most happy fella in the whole Napa Valley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how you want to leave uh, something that you do, like just feeling overjoyed, like overfilled with joy. I love that. I, I'm happy to participate. Hi, y'all. Um, my name's Kristen. I'm a social worker in, uh, in New York City. Um, I live in Queens. I when we normally have an office, I work in Manhattan. Uh, I, I do slightly different, like less traditional social work. I, um, I'm a college persistence advisor, which is a really fancy way of saying that I work with uh, low income first generation college students. Um, we run an eight year program that gets them into and through college. So we get them from ninth grade until they graduate college. Um, so obviously my population has been deeply affected uh, by the last bunch of months. Um, a lot of them have dealt with issues of displacement from their college campuses or not having, you know, a steady home to go home to, um, death in their immediate family. Um, some of our students also got sick. Um, so lots, lots of things, as I'm, I'm sure everybody's population has been affected in its own way um, over the last, gosh, seven or eight months, however long it's been, I don't know anymore. <laughs> um, uh, and so, Switching gears a little bit, I mean, I would love to talk about maybe some of the more fun stuff. I'm, I'm sitting staring at probably the most fun thing I've picked up uh, the last bunch of months. I started doing needlepoint again, which I haven't done since I was like a teenager. So like that was like a fun thing to like pick up on and really like 
it, when Erica talks a lot about mindfulness, um, and Erica and I actually got our MSWs together, so I've known Erica for a minute now. Um, uh, she's she's always been my like my like yogi and very mindful friend, and I'm I'm less good at that between the two of us um, for sure. But that is one of the things that. I think does like I can get lost in just like sitting there and like doing this like you know a million times um so I do do things in that respect but also what I have found helpful and I very much understand this comes from a, the privileged perspective of having a job that a pays me enough and b has good enough insurance but I ended up actually upping the amount of therapy I was doing um for myself because of the amount of I think my my counselor was particularly worried about I think burnout and secondary trauma for all the things that I was coming and like I would just like sit down well now on zoom and I would just start crying over like the massive amount of things that were going on with with my students um and so I I went from like a bi-weekly therapy session to a weekly therapy session which I have never done but has been you know has proven to be really helpful um given given the circumstances and so I mean I I, I hope it's a given for a lot of us that you know we, you know we're, we're receiving some sort of of counseling especially those of us who do you know that micro level work but maybe thinking about like, are you getting off? Like, do you need more? Is it something that, you know, my, my therapist was willing to work with me on like a rate that would be more, you know, affordable. So, so I thought that was a big thing too, was just making sure that like, you're, you're getting the care that you need to. That's a really good one. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. Yeah. And too, uh, one of the things about checking in with yourself and, and seeing where you're at is, is noticing that maybe the self-care isn't enough, you know, that you'd need the extra help, the extra guidance. Um, maybe if you're not in therapy, maybe you're getting extra supervision at work. Um, you know, the, one of the things about becoming more mindful is that as things are happening and as your, you know, thoughts are coming in your mind, you might start to realize that like, I'm, I'm, I might be dealing with secondary trauma. Maybe I'm not processing the ongoing trauma. Like this year has been traumatic for most people on some level. You know, are you really taking the time to process that and sit with that and then move with it in a healthy way? And a lot of times we need help with that in therapy. We need someone who can give us that unbiased guided opinion and, and help us like reframe the way that we're thinking so that we continue to, to go throughout the day. And I think as social workers, we forget that we can go do it too. Like we're so used to just like being the therapist instead of getting therapy. And that, you know, I'm not in therapy right now, but you know, like when we were in grad school, that was a very stressful time. And knowing that I had therapy Every Saturday, 11 a.m., that was my 45 minutes to talk about my stuff, to decompress my week. Like, it was my me time on top of other things, but it was, it was really helpful to help me stay on a track that I can navigate through life and through grad school and through whatever else was going on because I had someone to navigate it with me. So even so, if you've been thinking about therapy, <laughs> anyone in here, I would absolutely um, also think about reaching out um, and speaking to someone because the helpers need help too, and we forget that a lot of times. We're so used to just being the helper, but you honoring yourself is also getting help. Vanessa, did you want to share? Um, I've been walking slash jogging, <laughs> um, and also recently started therapy for myself because, um, like Kristen said, there's a lot of stuff that we've been dealing with. Um, I'm also in, um, psychotherapy, so I've been hearing a lot of stuff from my clients that, you know, could be eventually vicarious trauma, so. And I have my own personal stuff going on. So I, I decided to work on myself as well. That's exactly why I wanted to do this chapter chat <laughs> is like what you just said is because as social workers, not only are we helping clients, but you, you come to the profession for a reason. So you tend to usually be the one that is, you know, working with your families, 
like you're helping them through the crisis, working with your community. So like you're helping everyone and taking on everyone's pain. And I think you guys did a really good job of saying that. What about Ruth or Ashley? Um, yeah, I um, actually wanted to talk about spending time in nature. That has been actually really helpful. Um, even when the pandemic first started, it was still cold, <laughs> but it was nice to take some time outside to like just observe and actually watch the seasons change. Um, like watching how it was completely bare in March and then by like April, like the started to see like the things sprouting and growing and like actually paying attention to that as I was walking. Um, I even then started taking up like jogging and like movement like we've been talking about. Um, but I think what I've taken away from that practice is every day, even if it's like a short amount of time, I'm spending some time outside um, just to get some sun or even sometimes yesterday with the rain, feeling some rain. Um, it's been, I think, just helpful in trying to develop that mindful practice. So I've, and I've been sharing that with my clients and actually just people in my life. And some of them have actually started to, to do the, it themselves. So I found that to be really helpful. That's great. You know, I'm a lover of nature. So I <laughs> Yeah. That. Ruth? Hi. Um, I actually uh, wasn't on video before because I was engaging in self-care, which meant cleaning up in my living room. Um, I'm, I'm doing everything in my living room. My living room is my art studio, my office, my, you know, my entertainment. And I have completely let go of any standards that I had prior to COVID <laughs> regarding keeping things in place. It's just not important. No one is coming over anyway. I live alone. I don't make the bed anymore. And, you know, I was someone who started my day every day as a ritual practice of, you've already accomplished one thing by making the bed today. Yay. And at some point during COVID, I was like, this just doesn't matter <laughs> anymore. <laughs> And that has freed me up to do a lot more self-care for me. So now if I end up with a pile of stuff, I mean, you'll see a pile right behind me of newspapers. I don't care, you know, I just have let all of that go. I, I decided to get on this today because I loved the title. And I've had so many friends, uh, social workers and not, through this time who have been utterly depressed, utterly anxiety ridden, um, gone in and out of inpatient, and I'm the complete opposite end of the spectrum. I'm someone who's been thriving. I've been doing just as much I would be doing in pre-COVID life, uh, minus the suitcase and the traveling. That's been the most difficult thing for me. I go to a lot of conferences and trainings all over the country and that all just stopped. So I had to recreate a, a stress-free life here at home. And I think I was in a perfect position to do that because I'm already on disability and it's a disability that requires me, I have multiple chemical sensitivity, which means I need to be avoiding, you know, dollar stores and supermarkets and things like that. So now we can't go there anyway. And I feel like, wow, the world's finally caught up with me. Now you're all stuck at home. And I, I haven't felt this healthy in years because I'm actually getting a lot less toxified. So in a really ridiculous way, having to be in quarantine has improved my physical well-being, which of course improves my, you know, entire well-being. And I worked at the Center for Stress Reduction for a couple of years. And I'm the kind of therapist that says, I will not teach my clients something that I have not practiced myself. And it, it might not be something I've perfected. It might be something I'm still, you know, working on. I don't think I've perfected anything, but I really have a storehouse of guided imagery techniques, progressive muscle relaxation, using essential oils, spacing out on a stupid movie, um, doing yoga, walking in nature. I mean, I could just rattle off a hundred things. And because I've practiced it for so long with so many people, doing it for myself is just second nature. I mean, I can wake up and know, oh, this is a day where you are not getting dressed like today, I'm still in my pajamas. This is a day where it's okay if you don't take a shower. And this doesn't mean anything. This is not a, 
you know, symptomatic of doing a depressive or suicide evaluation. <laughs> this is something out of the ordinary of pandemic times. And if I spend two, three days this week uh, reading magazines, that's okay because I'm such a, a diehard go-getter and I know I usually do more in a week than most people do in a month. I just, I know this about myself. And because I have so many community members right now that are really struggling with illnesses not even related to COVID or parents who are really ill, um, I feel like I'm in a really good position to be helpful to them. And that having the gratitude for my well-being has given me more space to give more to other people. I'm baking for people that are taking car trips to protests and rallies. You know, I'm supporting people who are doing voter registration. I, I can't, I can't uh, get myself to 10 places at once. So I'm giving it up, you know, and if I make two phone calls a day to people I haven't spoken to in a while, that's great. I might have four people on the list and I might only get to two. So um, in the beginning of the pandemic, I, I basically wrote myself my own treatment plan for lack of a better word, right? Okay, how are we gonna get through this? And um, I've been following it and it's really working for me. So I just, I'm, I'm actually surprised there aren't more people on the Zoom because I think there are a lot of people who aren't good at this. And I think that there are social workers that don't have the experience or the, the, um, the practice of, of doing yoga or doing meditation or the things that we've talked about. And I'm just continuing to find more interesting ways to keep stress at a minimum. And because I've been doing it in my life due to illness for so many years and as a therapist, it, it's come in really handy during this time. So I, I don't find that I've been particularly challenged by overwhelming stress, um, which is amazing. It's really, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased with myself. <laughs> so I just, I will share that. And I have real compassion for people who are really struggling with this. So, um, you know, I send people uh, links to uh, Insight Timer, which is a wonderful app for meditation. I send links to people for silly videos, especially to my friends who are really uh, stressed. And as a therapist, I have uh, one private client right now. And my biggest stress professionally is that we've been meeting outside. And now that the season is changing, she, although she's tech savvy, she has no interest in doing this online. She doesn't want any type of telehealth platform. So I have great concerns about this professionally, about how we're going to do this. I'm happy to do phone sessions with her and that's just not her way. So I maybe have two or three weeks left. I mean, we were supposed to meet today and we had to cancel it because of the rain. I'm in the Hudson Valley and it was kind of chilly. And we've rescheduled for Thursday and you know, hopefully it'll be nice out. But at some point, you know, I don't see us being out there at a bonfire in the snow. <laughs> I mean, that might be fun, but I don't know any other therapist that's uh, planning on doing that. So if anyone has any suggestions on how to deal with uh, the stress of not knowing how you're going to see your clients. I'm open to that. <laughs> thank you for listening, everyone. Look, thank you for sharing that. I could totally relate to a lot of the things you said, including binging on my favorite show on Netflix for like hours and like wearing the same thing for like a day. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that was, she actually said a lot of things that like are actually really great for me to like round off on. So one of the things that I really like that Ruth said is that she's had a practice for so long now that now during a chaotic time, like she said, she's thriving. She has found a way to navigate through this because she has a practice of it. Mm -hmm. And that's like one of the biggest things I want you guys to take away um, in terms of developing your own self-care practice. And the other thing that I really like that Ruth said is that it changed. So as we change, as the world around us changes, your self-care practice might also change. Uh -huh. I think I froze. <laughs> froze, but we can hear you. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, right, so you know, she went from making her bed every morning to 
whatever, the bed's not going to be made. And uh-huh. instead of looking at, at it as, oh, I'm gonna, she didn't beat herself up for not making her bed, she recognized that the pressure of making the bed wasn't going to satisfy her during this time, so she let it go. You know, and, and I think sometimes, too, that's one of the things about self-care is we start to think that it's a have to. You know, what happens on the day you can't go for a run? What happens on the day it is too rainy to go outside? You know, do you have, I call it like my arsenal, like a, a handful, a, a plethora, whatever word you want to use, a list of things that I know that I can do if maybe I can't do one thing, if I don't have time to do another. And it could just be five minutes of breath work. And I think that's one one of the biggest reasons why I encourage meditation so much is because you really only need, you can even use three minutes. I've had apps that with three minute meditations, you know. Um, If I, you know, there are days where I don't want to work out and I don't work out. And that's how I honor myself that day. You know, there are days where I wake up and I'm like, I am going to lay in bed and watch the rest of the development for the rest of the day. And that's still honoring myself because I'm allowing myself to change with how I'm feeling. And that's why mindfulness becomes so important because when you're able to know yourself, know your mood that day, know it's, have an understanding of what's going on around you, you can adapt better with your self-care practice. Um, you know, like not, I, I never, I never take bubble baths. Like I'd never, I hadn't taken a bath since I was like 12. I don't know, like a long time. But if I was forcing myself to be like self-care is taking a bubble bath, I'd be constantly stressed out about the fact that I can never take a bath. And that's not what you want. You want to have something that you can come to and enjoy, but also if you can't get to it, knowing that there's other things and also having the freedom of letting it go. I was saying to Sam before, one of the things I teach in yoga is sometimes the best intention is having no intention at all. You just show up and you just show up for yourself. Like if I, every time I went to yoga, I said, I'm going to do a handstand today. And then I go to do a handstand and I bust my face every single time. By the end of class, I might be more frustrated. I might be more sad. I might think, oh, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do yoga anymore. And sometimes there are days where I'm like, I'm going to do a handstand today. And like with practice, you learn to let it go for the days that you do bust your face. But if I was hell bent on the handstand and then I didn't get it, that's not self-care when I start to beat myself up about it. So like kind of with like the bed, like if she started beating herself up about not making the bed, that's when it shifts from the self-care to like, more like a chore or more like something you have to force and you want it like i said you want to be able to find the joy you want to be able to let go when you need to let go of the schedule let go of this idea that it has to be this way you know if you set out to run five miles but you only made it three you still ran you still got outside you still moved your body you know goals are great um but for self-care, I always say just, just showing up for yourself is, is the goal, however that may be. Um, yeah, so I just hope that, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you guys through a meditation now and just like an introductory kind of thing. And during the meditation, I'm going to talk about self-care and start, to, I don't want that to be the spark for you to sort of start to think about what are the things that I like, what are the things that help me come back to myself, maybe detach from the outside world? Um, What can I do for me that allows me to be my best me throughout my life? And then also, when I can't be my best me, how can I still honor that? And then how can I also find another way, another self-care practice? What can I constantly be adding to my arsenal so that I continue, I can continue. Because we get lost in the chaos and it starts to feel like life is the absolute worst thing. And you can still take that three minutes, that five minutes, however long you need to find a moment of joy within yourself 
and then you can start to sort of see more joy in the outside world. Well, one of the things I need to say often is, uh, thank God in our household, we honor imperfection. Absolutely. And self-care is not a perfect practice. I, can I just add one more thing? I, I've noticed for me that um, I also couldn't go to the gym because it's closed and I was doing that twice a week and I can't go to yoga class. And I was we can't hear you, Ruth. Can you talk, can you talk up? We, can't, we can hear you're talking, but we can't hear you very well. Sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I have a low voice. Um, I very much miss going to the gym for aqua aerobics, and I very much miss going to the yoga studio for all sorts of yoga. That was like the biggest uh, shift for me during this time. Those were also social times for me. And of course, I can't swim in my own home, but I can do yoga at home. So I found some sites for that. And um, th so that was one thing. I have to figure out what I'm going to do in the winter because of the walking. I did walk in the rain last week. I can put on lots of clothes and walk when it's cold, but I know if there's five feet of snow, I won't be walking. Um, I'll even walk when it's dark out with a flashlight. So I try not to let that, you know, I j sometimes I have to worry about bears, but that's about it. Um, <laughs> In, in terms of the change in season, I think that impacts stress reduction techniques a lot. I worked in drug treatment for nine years and outpatient drug treatment, and we were always uh, acutely aware of people's triggers that would come up around seasons, whether it was a death anniversary or a holiday or a birthday or whatever was a, a normal you know, trigger for them, a usual trigger. And I think that just um, anyone who's stuck at home or dealing with uh, COVID issues the stressors will shift as seasons shift. So, um, you know, there's, there's just things that innately occur. And I'm starting to notice that as the leaves are coming down here and the leaves are changing, like my head is saying, okay, it's time to think about your plan for the next two, three months on how you're going to uh, keep steady and stable. You know, what is it that you want to continue that worked well for you this summer? And what is it that you need to let go of? And one of the things I've been doing is making my own little camps. Like this summer, I gave myself dance camp and I signed up for um, three different dance festivals online and one dance festival that you could actually go in person to an outdoor theater. Okay, so that's done, right? What's now? So now there are other types of dance performances that are happening that you can sign up and maybe it's free, maybe it's $20. There are other organizations that are now trying to um, look out for people that are stuck at home. And I've, I've really been appreciative of NASW of offering so many things for free, offering so many things to people who aren't even members or haven't been for years. That's been really wonderful for me. Uh, otherwise I would not have this connection right now with so many other social workers. I don't have a, have a team out there. I have my friends of social workers that are local and I do, I do reach out with them to figure out what we're gonna do. So I just, I wanted to see if anyone else uh, was looking into what shifts might happen seasonally because of schedules or not just with clients, but with our own selves. Thanks. Erica, um, Sam, I'm sorry, I don't wanna be rude, but I have to log off. It was a pleasure seeing you all. Thank you so much for coming. It was a pleasure meeting you. <laughs>
So if everyone can find a comfortable position, maybe you pull the seat from underneath you a little bit, rolling the shoulders back and down. Just begin to close the eyes. You're not doing anything special with the breath yet. Just begin to notice the sounds around you. Allowing the eyes to relax, resting in one spot. Noticing if you're breathing shallow. Noticing any tension in the body. Just taking a second here. Taking a deep inhale through the nose. Taking a big sigh out of the mouth on the exhale. Deep inhale in. Exhale out of the mouth. One more, inhale. And an exhale. Now just noticing again how the body feels. Is the jaw relaxed? Can you drop the tongue from the roof of your mouth? Can you roll the shoulders back and down more? Can you find more ease in the body? And we'll take some counted breaths here. So we'll breathe in for four and out for four. I'll count for you. So just focus on the breathing, using my voice as a guide, or breathing however you'd like, whichever works for you. On your next inhale, you'll breathe in for one, two, three, four. Exhale, four, three, two, Inhale, one, two, three, four. Exhale, four, three, two, one. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Exhale, four, three, two, one. Inhale, one, two, three, Four, exhale, four, three, two, one. One more round, breathing in for one, two, three, four. Exhale, four, three, two, one. And I want you to continue breathing in this way you can count on your own. You can take longer breaths, maybe shorter breaths. I want you to focus on every inhale and every exhale. And in meditation, we allow the breath to be our guide. And we're taking these deep breaths. We'll start to notice sensations in the body. You might feel some discomfort maybe in the way that you're sitting. And if you do, I want you to imagine sending the breath to that space in the body. You feel a tightness in the chest, breathing into that space. 
it's in the low back, if it's in the shoulders. Rather than forcing yourself to change, allow the breath to find the ease in that space. The deeper we breathe in, and the stronger we breathe out, the more ease we find in our bodies, and therefore within ourselves and our minds. And if your mind begins to wander, no judgment, let the thought pass once you acknowledge it and then come back to the breath. Now begin to bring some awareness into the abdomen, relaxing the muscles there. See if you could feel the natural rising of the belly and the falling. Maybe you place your hand on your belly to feel each rise and each fall. Take a few deep breaths like this. Now imagine that breath slowly moving up towards the chest. Feel the expansion in the lungs, feeling the chest rise on the inhales, feeling the contraction on every exhale. And again, if you want, you can bring that hand right to the chest. Feeling every deep inhale. And every long exhale. Now just bring your attention to the nostrils. Here you'll probably be able to actually feel the breath coming in and coming out. You may notice a slight tickle on the upper lip. You may notice the warm air when you're forcing that breath out. If you haven't tried breathing in through the nose and out through the nose, now is a good time. In yoga, we call this the ujjayi breath. And it allows us to feel a bit more control and a bit more centering. Just continuing to notice how the breath moves in the body. And these are just three different spots that you can rest your awareness in when you come to meditation focusing on the belly or the chest or the nostrils. So as we begin to go into the self-care meditation, noticing which breath felt better for you, you can place your hand on your chest or on your belly. Let's take one more deep breath in. Deep breath out. 
And again, your mind might wander here. That's natural. Just continue to come back to the breath every time it does. You are worthy of receiving love from yourself. You are worthy of being your priority. You are worthy of receiving the love and appreciation and care you so easily give to others. You are worthy of enjoying this self-care meditation. Breathe that in, allowing yourself to be open to receiving your love. So imagine with me that you're sitting in the middle of a large open room of a house. The sunshine illuminates the room and warms your skin. And a soft, soothing aroma makes you feel calm and safe. It's quiet and the noises you hear are the songs of nature coming in from your windows. Even though the large open room may not resemble your current residence, you know this is your home, where your heart and your body and your soul feel grounded and vibrant. You are safe here. Breathing in to this meditation, beginning to listen to what your inner voice is telling you. What do you need right now? What would make your body feel good? Your mind feel good? Your soul feel good? Just take a moment to sit with your breath and with the answers that come up for you. Breathing into this space. See the answers in your mind and watch yourself as you stand up and move towards the door. You deserve to feel good. You deserve to shine. Open the door and see those things you called to mind waiting there, ready for you to call them in taking a deep breath of gratitude. And one by one, invite in each of those things you identified. Each one of those things you know will make you feel good. There's no judgment on what you invited. Remind yourself what was discovered in this self-care meditation. Maybe you invited in new boundaries you need to put in place to protect your energy. Maybe you invited in the permission to say no. Maybe you invited in the permission to say yes. Maybe you invited in something that seems lavish. It's all okay. You are worthy of it all. So take a deep breath in and see yourself in the middle of this room again. Surrounded by all the things you have thought about to show yourself love, to care for the phenomenal person that you are You are worthy of this moment.
You can bring the hands to the heart center. Leave it on your chest or bring it into like a prayer hand. Taking a slight bow of the head to honor yourself. Even just simply showing up for this chapter chat was honoring yourself. Allowing yourself to speak freely and openly about all the things that have happened this year is honoring yourself. Allowing yourself to laugh and giving yourself grace amidst everything going on is honoring yourself. Taking one more deep breath in and a big exhale, letting it all go. When you're ready, taking your time, you can slowly begin to open the eyes. I just want to thank you, Erica, for doing that and leading it to us. I'm so glad that we got it recorded so we can send it out to our members to enjoy it as well for those who were able to participate tonight. And um, I want to thank everyone for taking time out of your day to join us. And I hope you continue to join us in, like Ruth said, our free and open activities uh, to help you during this time and just to help you as social workers. I hope everyone has a good night. Do you want to leave with any parting words, Erica? Um, hmm. Just continue to be gracious with yourself and miss everything going on. Just continue to remind yourself that you are doing enough just by showing up. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.